Um, we are getting some more copies made of the outline if, if you don't have one. Um, we're going to start discussing uh, leadership from talking about Saul, King Saul. We, we've been looking at leadership concepts, principles, uh, throughout the Old Testament, uh, and then our, our plan is to kind of carry that forward into the New Testament and specifically look at God's design um, and pattern for leadership within the local church uh, so that we will not be uh, sheep without uh, shepherds. Um, and we've looked at Moses and Joshua, who are very clearly God's chosen leaders, divinely commissioned um, we're going to see something slightly different with Saul. Uh, he is, in a way, chosen by the Lord. He is the Lord's anointed. Um, but in many ways, he is the king that, that Israel is asking for. Um, and they kind of get what they're asking for with Saul. And so we'll have a little bit more um, lessons to learn, uh, negatively speaking, failures uh, in Saul's leadership that we can learn from. But it's good to see everyone today. Before we get started um, here with this outline, um, let's first begin with a prayer together, if you bow with me. Heavenly Father, you are the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and we are so humbled before you, recognizing, Lord, that we are unworthy to come into your presence, and yet you have offered us uh, a relationship with you, fellowship with you, your spirit dwelling within us. We are so in awe, Lord, of your love and your grace that you desire to uh, dwell with us so intimately to have us as your children. Lord, we ask that you will help us to draw close to you um, in, in holiness and in your holiness, that, that you will help us uh, as we study your word today, that we can have open uh, and honest good hearts, that we can make application of the things that we study so we can uh, better serve you and glorify you in the way that we live from day to day. Lord, we ask that you'll bless uh, this congregation, this flock, that we might grow to uh, better be what you desire for us to be uh, as far as our, our structure and our leadership, that it might bring you honor uh, and glory, that it might help us grow um, and, and accomplish your purposes for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So, as I said, we're, we're making some more copies if anybody does end up uh, needing uh, a copy of this outline. But we're going to start in Deuteronomy 17. And we, we finished our last class by kind of previewing this passage. Uh, but after Joshua dies um, and we get into the book of, of Judges, uh, Israel goes for a long time without any clear leader. Uh, you know, there's judges that do arise to, to lead them in some way or another. Sometimes that's, that's more naturally. Sometimes that's even just kind of more locally. Um, but uh, in Deuteronomy 17, thank you, Mike, uh, if you want to just set them up here. Or, or if anybody needs uh, an outline, if you want to raise your hand, uh, Mike has some extras of those. In Deuteronomy 17, God makes it clear that uh, it was his plan uh, for them to eventually have kings. Um, so let's let's read this passage again together. Deuteronomy 17, we're going to read verse 14 through 20. Um, would somebody like to read that for us? Deuteronomy 17, verse 14 through 20. Ben, you got it? Thank you. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say... I will set a king over me, but like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as a king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return to that way, return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book in a book a copy of, his, of this law approved by the Levitical priests. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it in all the days of his life, 
that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the com commandment either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. Okay. Um, and so God anticipates, uh, first of all, that they are going to ask for a king. Uh, but it is part of his plan that he will set up a king for them. And, and what commands did God give Israel regarding the setting up of a king? Who, who was this king post, first, uh, supposed to be, first of all? One of, one of their brothers. Yes. Uh, so it was not supposed to be a foreigner. Uh, it was supposed to be one, one of their brothers. And what, what else do you see there uh, in verse 15? God chosen. Yes. This was to be God-directed, God-chosen. Um, and he gives them some instructions uh, about what the king must not do and what the king must do. Uh, what, what are the three things that he's not supposed to do? Not multiply horses. Okay. Not acquire many horses. Which is? And not, uh, the, the last thing verse, at the end of verse 17, not acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And one other thing in between this. Wives. Not, not acquire many wives. Um, why, why those th three things? What, what's he warning, uh, the, the, the king, the leader against here? Well, in, in horses, it's not just a matter of horses, but it's the power or the strength of the nation based on its you know, military, literally the military. Um, right. Uh, the, the gold are, is idolatry, riches, you know, the more riches you get, that's where you start to go. And then mm -hmm. the wives, scripture tells us, it's natural for you to try to please your wife. The more of them you got all these wives, suddenly you, more and more your attention is going that way instead of uh, where it needs to be. Right. Um, you, you think about from a, from a worldly perspective, um, what, what are the main things that are going to increase the power and influence um, of a king, of a leader? If he wants to be a strong leader from an earthly perspective. All the things that God says don't. All, all the things that God says not to do. Increase his military strength. Increase his influence. We, we see especially with Solomon, that's one of the main reasons he was multiplying wives. He's making these uh, treaties with foreign nations and bringing in these foreign, foreign wives. Um, uh, increasing wealth, all the things that, from an earthly perspective, would make a great leader, uh, would make him more influential, more powerful, uh, God says, don't do any of those things. What is the leader supposed to do? God is the leader, right? Uh, yes. Um, he, specifically in verse 18, he's to write for himself in a book, a copy of the law. What, you know, he's got a bunch of scribes. Why, why can't he just, you know, have some of the scribes take care of that? That doesn't mean he reads it. Yeah. He, he is supposed to interact with every word, with every letter on the page. He's supposed to write out the entire law. Um, you know, e even just reading the law, it, it might be easy to kind of gloss over some things. But when you have to slow down, slow enough that you write every letter of every word, you're, you're going to make sure that you've read every word. You're not, you're not going to have any excuse to say, well, I, I just kind of missed that part. No, you, you wrote it. See, it's there in your own handwriting. And not only is he to write it, once he's written it, what is he supposed to do with it? Keep it living and read it daily. Yes. It's to be with him and he shall read in it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment. Um, there, what, what, what's one thing that it warns against that might cause him to deviate from the law? Exalting himself. Yes. His position as leader uh, might, might cause him to kind of, instead of viewing God as the leader... He might start viewing himself as the leader. But if he is spending day in, day out with this law that, that he has copied, um, it's to remind him that he is not the leader. God is. Um, and he is not to, to lift himself up. He's to continue 
humbled before the Lord, letting God direct his steps, not turning to the right hand or the left hand in any way. And so if we want to talk about leadership, um, I think this is a, an extremely helpful passage in seeing what God's intent for leadership was. Um, it wasn't power and influence in any of the ways that, that humans um, try to, to build and bolster power and influence. Uh, it was closeness to the Lord, following him, faithfully um, allowing him to, to, to be the leader. Comments or questions on Deuteronomy 17 and, and concepts that we can learn from this passage? Jonathan? If, if you look later in the Old Testament, all of these are exactly what Solomon failed in. Right. Every single one. Right. Yeah, and, and really leader after leader. I think we see that maybe most clearly in Solomon. But leader after leader falls into these same things uh, that they were told not to do. Go ahead, David. One thing, the, the first five books are generally considered the law, so to speak. Right. And referring to it here, that doesn't just include God's commandments. It includes the history of what God has had, how God has always related to mankind. Right. Up until that point and how he's always provided for them. So it's it's a foundation for that faith, not just the written laws and instructions. Right. Not not just a kind of a, a checklist of, of laws. Um <coughs> what what he's writing down here would include uh a, a memory of everything that God had done for his people and, and really a, a self revelation of God who he is. Um and so that's uh much much deeper than just uh the, the legal requirements, so certainly. Okay, well, let's let's keep Deuteronomy 17 in our minds as we now turn our attention towards the first king of Israel. And let, let's see how that takes place. Um, let's turn to 1 Samuel 8. 1 Samuel 8. And let's start reading in verse 4. Um does somebody want to read verse 4 through 9 for us? For Samuel 8, 4 through 9. Okay, go ahead. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, as being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Okay. And let's skip a little bit further. We're going to read something similar in verse 18 uh, through 20 here. Uh, would somebody like to read that for us? 18 through 20 of 1 Samuel 8. Uh, Rick, thank you. And you shall cry out in that day because of your king, which you have chosen for yourselves. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, we will have a king over us, that he may, that we may also be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Okay. Um, and then let me just briefly read uh, chapter 10, verse 17 through 19. Uh, later on we see it says, Now Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah, and he said to the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God, who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses. And you have said to him, Set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Okay, so three different times there. We, we see the the people are... are Re rebuked god says that they have have rejected him um and yet deuteronomy 17 said that god would set a king over them so what what's improper about the way that israel is approaching this what's improper about their desire for a king here they want someone to take the place 
and the ability to judge over them. God's the one who is the judge. And they're like, over and over, we want a king to judge us. We want a, He's going to be judging by earthly standards. He's going to be judging by something other than what God would do. Right. And, and, and what, what other influence is involved there? What, what are they seeing? Other nations around them. The other nations around them. We want to be like the other nations. You know, they all have their, their great kings um, that they, they honor and, and they lift up. And, you know, he, he's the one who, who kind of rallies the troops and leads them into battle. He's the one who judges them. We, we want to be like that. Um, so Deuteronomy 17 said it was part of God's plan to set up a king. But, but the problem is where that desire is coming from here. Uh, and, and God anticipates that in Deuteronomy 17, that that would be part of their motive in, in initially asking for a king. Um, you know, if, if the people had said, we were reading the law, and we saw here in Deuteronomy 17, you know, not that they had chapters back then, but we, we saw here in the law that, um, that God said he would set up a king, um, and we, we feel like that, that's part of God's design, maybe we should, maybe it's time for us to do that. Do, do you think that would have been a problem? No, but that, that's, that's not what's going on here at all. And, and very clearly, from the mouth of God, for, through the mouth of Samuel, multiple times, they're warned against the, the heart that is behind this desire. That they, they are wanting a king that is exactly what Deuteronomy 17 says they shouldn't have. Right? They're, they're looking at all these other nations... And, you know, the, the king that's building their military strength and their wealth and their influence, we want a king like that. That's not what God desires for them. Um, so any other comments or questions here on, on kind of the, the, the motives, the outlook, or the priorities that, that are leading um, this initial desire for a king? Go ahead, Patty. Um, this is coming from the people now who we, we read in Judges. They do, they do whatever is seems best in their sight. Right. They've lost that unifying thing of the going to the priest, the, all of the things that God has set up through Moses' law. Mm-hmm. That would have unified them, going to Jerusalem as a leader. I mean, being part of a, you know, of a, of a great thing. Right, right. Yeah, w- without a physical king, um, they've completely ignored their spiritual king. Um that there was no king in Israel. They all, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Um, but but the, the issue there is not, there was a lack of human leadership. Um, there, there was, by their own uh, response, a lack of divine leadership um, because they weren't responding correctly to the Lord. Go ahead, David. Again, thinking about some of the context here. Um, in Deuteronomy, this is Moses... He's preparing to die. Joshua is going to be taking over. He provides all these warnings from the Lord. He gives them the instructions regarding uh, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal when you go into the land. This is he did blessings on this side, the cursings on this side. Mm-hmm. God anticipated everything that would happen with the nation, including them asking for the king. Mm-hmm. If we want to step back a little bit further, okay. Um, God anticipated our disobedience Mm -hmm. before the foundation of the world and he prepared for his eternal kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, he gave the instructions in Deuteronomy 17, but even in there he says, you will ask for a king like the nations around you. Right. He tells them what their perspective is going to be as well. Right. Um, So God knows everything that's going to happen. And make plans and provisions for it. Certainly, yeah. And so this, uh, e- even their their disobedience and the consequences of it are, are all uh, w- within God, God's uh, God's ultimate plan. Um, and, and and perhaps he, he's letting them experience in the book of Judges, um, you know what 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 it's like to be sheep without a shepherd. Um, First and foremost, because they're not allowing God to be their shepherd. But go ahead. David. And, and this falls in the category, I'm sure a lot of people have heard this expression, be careful what you ask for. Right, right. Yeah, and they're, they're warned against that here. Um, and uh, uh, Samuel is, is to warn them what this king will, will ultimately do. Um, 
But, but let, let's continue forward now um, and look in chapter 9 to see when this king is ac actually selected. Because this is going to be a God-anointed, God-appointed king. But I think in many ways, God gives them the king that they desire. God gives them the, the king that they deserve, so to speak, with Saul. Um, and the, there'll be a, kind of a different approach as we, we come to David uh, in our, our next study. So let's look in 1 Samuel 9, uh, verse 1 and 2. Um, I'll read here. It says, There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Bikorath, son of Ephiah, uh, a Benjamite, a man of wealth. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Okay, so that's our introduction to, to this, this coming king, to Saul. But let's look now in chapter 10. And somebody want to read verse 20 through 24 for us. Um, we'll cut that out a little bit. Uh, chapter 10, verse 20 through 24. Could I get a volunteer? David? Then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by lot. He brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its clans, and the clan of the Matrites was taken by lot, and, the, and Saul the son of Kish was taken by lot. But when they sought him, he could not be found. So they inquired again of the Lord, Is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, Behold, he has hidden himself among the, among the baggage. Then they ran and took him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people, and all the people shouted along with the king. Okay. Um, so from, from our introduction to Saul in chapter 9, and his actual... Uh, uh, appointing as, as king or selection as king here in chapter 10. What's what's the focus? What qualities of Saul set him apart from the other people uh, and gave him the appearance of a good leader? Here, Samuel even says, um, uh, do you see whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. What what set him apart? Yeah, he was, he was really tall. Uh, he was head and shoulders above all the other people. We were told back in chapter 9, he, he was really handsome. Um, he looked like a good leader. Here in chapter 10, though, even with his appearance of a good leader, what, what's the first thing he's doing? When, when they, they go to select him, where is he? He's hiding. Does that sound like a very good leader? No, this doesn't sound like, you know, even from a human perspective. This doesn't sound like somebody who, who is just going to be this, this grand leader for Israel, but he looks like a leader. He's, he's got the appearance, you know. Um, and so from the very beginning, I, I think we see uh, this is somewhat doomed to, to failure. Um, what, what are some surface level qualities that we may be tempted to look for in a leader? Uh, how might this parallel our desire for, for leadership. Rich, prominent, political power, you, you name it. Right. Um, but really, some of the things back in Deuteronomy 17, you know, so, somebody who has a lot of connections, somebody who has a lot of influence, somebody who has uh, a lot of, uh, you know, power or capability in, in human terms, uh, Somebody who maybe is, is wealthy, uh, somebody who's charismatic, um, you know, every, everybody likes them. Um, you know, it, and, it, and it's not that, you know, being an effective communicator is a bad thing to leadership. I mean, that, that can be a very helpful thing, right? Um, but, but if everything that we're looking for in a leader is, um, is focused kind of on, on this physical, worldly appearances um, and, and uh, you know, physical power and influence, um, then, then we're really being just like Israel. Um, should these sorts of qualities influence our view of a leader? I included in there a reference to Isaiah 53. 
Uh, did you go over and read that? What, what does that remind us uh, about uh, the, the Messiah who would come and sacrifice himself? He didn't have anything that would make him appealing or attractive. Right. Nothing that would make him appealing or, or attractive in a, in a human sense. Um, you know, the, the very idea that we have tried to recreate paintings and pictures of what Jesus looked like and somehow make him into some, you know, I, I, I think the original idea behind it was like the, the, the perfect model of what, uh, at least from a, you know, uh, whatever century European perspective, the perfect man would look like. You know, that's completely wrong. Um, there's nothing in physical appearance that would, would cause Jesus to stand out that wasn't the focus at all. And yet, has there ever been a more important leader? It's not about the flesh. It's not about appearances. It's not about those physical things. And yet, to the Israelites here, that's what sets Saul apart. There's no one else like him. Not in any of the ways that matter, though. Comments or questions on that? Okay, let's go a little forward to chapter 11 now. Um, and, and I think there are going to be some positive things that we can learn uh, from Saul. Uh, pretty quickly, we're going to get into some negative things. But let's, let's go ahead and look in chapter 11 and see how God helps um, establish him as king. Uh, by the way, we didn't read it, uh, but at, at the end of chapter 10, verse 27... Um, it says, but some worthless fellow said, how can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present, uh, but he held his peace. So there's some who think, who is this guy? He's, he's not going to be able to help us at all. So right now, the people are not really all unified in, in following Saul um, as their king. So let's look down in chapter 11. And who wants to read verse 5 through 7 of 1 Samuel 11? Go ahead, Claire. Now there was Saul coming behind the herd from the field, and Saul said, What troubles the people that they weep? And they told him the words of the men of Jabesh. Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard this news, and his anger was greatly aroused. So he took a yoke of oxen and cut them into pieces, and sent them throughout all the territory of Israel by the hands of the messengers, saying, Whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out with one consent. Okay, and we'll we'll read 11 through 15 here in just a moment, but but let's go ahead and make sure we understand the context here. Um, so the, the men of, of Jabesh Gilead are being threatened by Nahash the Ammonite. Um, uh, they're trying to, to make uh, terms of a peace with him, and Nahash says, okay, you want a treaty with me? All of you pluck out your right eyes, and then I'll make a treaty with you. Um, and so this, this word comes to Saul, um, and it says here that the spirit rushed upon him. Um, but, but before we get to discussing this, let's go ahead and read 11 through 15, um, just, just to see how this, this ends. Uh, I'll go ahead and read starting in verse 11, and it says, And the next day Saul put the people in three companies, when they came into the midst of the camp in the morning, watch and struck down the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. Then the people said to Samuel, who is it that said, shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. But Saul said, not a man shall be put to death this day. For today, the Lord has worked salvation in Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, come, let us go to Gilgal and there renew the kingdom. So all the people went to Gal Gilgal and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they sacrificed peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Okay, so you see how God uses this to help establish uh, Saul as king. Um, and it says the spirit of God rushed upon Saul in verse 6. So this, this seems to be, uh, this is how God is working to help establish Saul as king. Um, what, what did the Spirit do through Saul to more fully unite the people behind him? Go ahead, Patty. Um, he showed Israel what would happen to them if they didn't follow him. Mm -hmm. So it was like a show of power and force. Uh, and sometimes people do need to be shown in a physical way what their punishment will be. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, and you know, this this is not Saul uh, going to the people and saying, um, I, "I think I'm going to go out and and maybe fight these people." Um, w would you guys like to come out and and, and do that with me? Yeah. You know, th this is Saul saying, the Spirit coming upon him. And him with great passion and energy saying, we're going out, and if you don't come with us, this is what's going to happen, right? I think there's something to be said here for, um, the, for God using great passion to, to unite the people together behind Saul. Um, when, when we can see sincere passion um in in someone else that maybe even if it's if it's kind of the passion that that we know we should have or we want to have but but we really have a hard time showing it when, when we see that actually demonstrated we think yes that that's that's what we need um and that's what what god uses here uh, i think that there is a there is a there is a uh, a place for for seeing that it's interesting um, he says there in verse 7, whoever does not come out after Saul and Samuel, he's still kind of, um, I don't know how you want to say this, but riding on the coattails of, of Samuel here um, and, and his spiritual influence over the people. Um, and God blesses him with great success. And what are some positive things about how Saul handles this success in this instance? was a rare occurrence in Saul's life, but in the end of uh, verse 13, he says, for today the Lord has worked salvation to Israel. Right. He gives credit to God in this case. And in this situation, when Saul is passionate, it's because he's, he's telling the people, you know, come with me against someone who's seeking to destroy us. Right. Against our enemies. Mm hmm so it's not it's not just passion after you know arbitrarily right. targeted. Mm -hmm. It's saying join with me in fighting our enemies together. Let's do this together. Right, and, and this is God directed passion. Yeah. Right. This is yeah. spirit led passion. Um, this is not some selfish passion that that he's feeling. Um, a selfish ambition that that he's he's driving after, um, and. You know, this very much parallels some of the lessons that we learned about the meekness of Moses. Um, when, when people opposed Moses, how, how did he handle it? He left it in the Lord's hands, right? Um, at least initially, now, that, that's going to contrast greatly with Saul later, right? But at least initially, um, when, when the people opposed him, and people are even saying, you know, who are those people who didn't want to have you as king? Let's bring them out and kill them. And Saul says, no, uh, we're, we're not going to do that. Not a man to be put to death this day. For today, the Lord has worked salvation in Israel. Um, and so early on in Saul's reign, I think we see God working to unify the people um, in this way. Uh, and some of the primary things that we can learn here is, is uh, a leader um, needs to be somebody who, who gives who gives strength to other people's convictions, right? Who who, who uh, demonstrates genuine passion um, and with God's strength and to God's glory demonstrates success in, in that. That that you remember with Joshua when they put their feet on the the necks of, of the people, seeing God working that success, marking that success. You see what the Lord's doing what was helpful in uniting all the people together and getting them passionate um, and involved uh, in, um, in, in supporting, the, ultimately, the work of the Lord. So any other comments or questions here in 1 Samuel 11? We're going to see this contrasted with some things later in uh, Saul's life. Um, I, I don't think we're going to have... Um, we're, we're not going to really get into Saul's opposition to David, but, but think for a moment about the contrast between here these people opposing Saul and him saying, no, we're not going to kill them. And then David, you know, just in Saul's mind being a competitor, 
Um, and Saul doing everything that he can to go kill him. Big contrast uh, in the, the way Saul handles that. But anything else in 1 Samuel 11 before we start getting into um, some negative examples? David? This, this case uh, with the, the people who originally said who so Saul reigned over us, he was not seeking uh, vengeance or retaliation. Mm-hmm. Those, those particular terms, that, like you say, contrasted with what he does with you with David. Right, right, definitely. Okay, uh, well, let, let's go ahead and look at 1 Samuel 13, if you want to turn over there. And uh, who wants to read 5 through 14 for us? 1 Samuel 13, 5 through 14. It's a little bit of a longer reading. Ben, you got it. Thank you. And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen and troops, like the sand on the seashore in multitude. They came up and camped in Michmash, to the east of beth Aven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, the people were hard-pressed. The people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered, scattering from him. So Saul said, Bring the burnt offering here to me, and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord, so I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. Because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Okay. And Samuel wrote, oh. Yeah, you can stop there at 14. Thank you. Um, so, what does Saul do wrong here? What's what's the problem with what he does? He's waiting around. He's, okay. He's delaying. He's not taking action. Well, I, I think, in fact, him waiting is what he should be doing. Um, so, we'll... Uh, what 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 in the end does he end up doing? Uh, Claire? He offers a profane sacrifice. Okay, he he offers a sacrifice. Why why would it be profane? He's not a Levite. Okay, he he's not a Levite. Um, th- there are there are times where um, it says David made a sacrifice, right? And it doesn't specify like it was through the hands of the Levite. I, I don't know necessarily if there couldn't be Levites involved in this, if there couldn't be. Um, uh, so I, I I guess I'm not sure that that's the primary problem. Uh, I think with the pressure, he could not handle the pressure. And he saw like everybody may be waiting for him to do something. Right, definitely there's a lot of pressure going on here. He's waiting seven days um, the time appointed by Samuel. Let, let's let's make a reference to that for a moment. So b- back up in verse eight, he waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. Look back in chapter ten and in verse eight. Chapter ten and verse eight. It says, "Then go down before me." This is Samuel speaking. And behold, I am coming down to you to offer burnt offering and to sacrifice peace offering. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you should do. So what? What did Samuel said? He's supposed to wait seven days, and he didn't. He got nervous. Yeah, he waited seven days, just not quite long enough on the seventh day. Um, he waited seven days, and Samuel was going to come and offer burnt offering and sacrifice peace offerings, um, and then show him what he should do. 
right? He was to, to wait on the Lord, wait on the direction of the Lord to determine what he should do. I, I think it might be helpful as well to see that in chapter 9 and verse 13, there's a situation um, where uh, Samuel is going up to offer sacrifice. And it says, the people will not eat till he comes, since he must bless the sacrifice. Um, so there, there, there does seem to be maybe a, a necessary waiting for Samuel to be involved in that. But, but even more so, what, what Samuel rebukes him for in particular, look down in verse 13. Of, uh, we're back in 1 Samuel 13. 1 Samuel 13, verse 13, it says, And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. I think primarily he's talking about what he was instructed to do back in chapter 10, right? You wait seven days. I'm going to come. I'm going to offer peace offering and, and burnt offering. Um, and then I'll tell you what you shall do. Tell you what the Lord wants you to do, right? Um, and so... Uh, Again, it, it could be that Saul himself is, um, and, and you know, offering the sacrifice in a way that he's not allowed to, not being a Levite. But I, I'm not sure that that's the primary focus of the passage. Uh, the passage seems to be more focused on the idea that he uh, did not handle this the way that, that God said. Um, go ahead, Carl. While he's waiting for this word from the Lord, life goes on, and God <laughs> allows. All of this buildup around him, and even his men starting to desert, and the Philistines camping to test his heart. Is he going right. to rely on God, or is he going to take matters into his own hand? Just think about how much life goes on around us. If we don't know what God wants us to do, we're going to take matters into our own hands, and we're going to fail. We need to be waiting on what the Lord says. It doesn't mean sitting around. It means finding out what he says and doing that. Right. I, I think this is a helpful illustration of the concept that we see many times through, throughout the Psalms and elsewhere. Wait on the Lord. Right? But what, what does that mean? Um, no matter how difficult, how scary, you know, how much things seem to be falling apart, we need his direction. We need his working. Especially when God has told us, <laughs> wait seven days, Samuel's going to come down, he's going to offer burnt offering and peace offering, and then he's going to tell you what to do. Then, then that's what you do, right? Um, and Saul, Saul waits most of the time, Right? Um, he waits seven days, but Samuel hasn't come yet. And it's as soon as he gets done offering the sacrifice that Samuel shows up. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and as, as Carl made reference to, th there are so many reasons in Saul's mind that this is legitimate, right? What, what, what are some of the good reasons that, that Saul, uh, has in his mind for why he can go ahead and, and initiate the, the sacrifice? People were putting pressure on. Yeah, do you, do you see the situation that the people are in here? Look, look back in verse 6. Um, the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard-pressed. The people hid themselves in caves and in holes and rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. Like, the people are not united. The people are not pre prepared for battle. They are trembling. They're, they're hiding in cisterns and tombs. Uh, this does not look good. Um, this is not making Saul look good as a leader, right? Um, all these people don't have confidence um, and, and, and are scattered about. And, and what, what does Saul specifically say down in verse 12? I've not sought the favor of the Lord. Right. Does that sound like a, a good reason? Yeah. He says, the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I will have not sought the favor of the Lord, so I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Um, again, I, I don't know if this is, in fact, by Saul's hands, or if he initiates this being done by, by Levites that are present. I don't, I'm not sure that's the primary issue. Um, but uh, he uh, allows all of that pressure um, and even what sounds like good reasoning, like we, 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 we can't wait. We need to, to seek the favor of the Lord, right? But he doesn't do what God said. Uh, other comments on that? Uh, he, like he waits seven days. It was so easy for him to like 
Well, he's late. Right. Send somebody to check on him. Like, see if something happened to him. See if mm -hmm. he's coming. Still coming. He was. He didn't mean to do that. But right. he was very. Good. Right. Go ahead, David. I, th I think again because of the pressure, he feels that he needs to seek the Lord. Samuel's already told him, if you wait for me, you will be given instructions as to what you're to do. Mm -hmm. so, so, in a sense, he's already promised to provide what Saul needs, number mm -hmm. one. Number two, what it reminds me of, Gideon, if I remember my history correctly, you know, he originally had 30,000 men, and God said, you got too many. Mm -hmm. He whittled it down to 300. Right. <laughs> And this was during the period of Judges where they were going through these very same things. The people were afraid of their enemy. They were hiding. And again, correct me if I'm wrong in this, if I'm, if I'm not remembering the right judge. But was, was Gideon the one that was hiding in the... The, uh, the wine press. The wine press. Uh, yeah. Um, th threshing grain threshing. in the wine press. Yeah. You know, so you've got a parallel to the circumstance, if you will. Mm -hmm. But at least here, you've already had, through Samuel, the promise that God was going to provide the direction. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, it, it still it shows a precursor to what we see then in chapter 15 in Samuel. Mm -hmm. There. Um, you know, to obey is better than sacrifice. Right. And, yeah. Um, and so, you can imagine in Saul's mind... Like, I'm failing as a leader. Look, look, look at all these people. You know, I, I'm, I'm not inspiring confidence in them. Uh, what can I do to, to gather these people back together? Um, because he's, he's focused on himself rallying these people together, himself doing this. Um, and, and it seems like he feels like, well, you know, maybe he's thinking more on an earthly plane. Samuel has forgotten. Samuel's running late. But, but really, the Lord has forgotten, right? Um, the Lord's not taking care of this situation. I need to take things into my own hands. Um, I need to kind of hurry God up here. Um, and so th this is the beginning of the end for Saul. And it, and it begins with this, this very basic idea um, that we're, we're allowing our own interpretation of the situation and how, how it appears to us and how it's influencing us and whether or not we look like a success or a failure to become the driving force in how we handle something. Instead of, what has the Lord said? We trust that he's going to lead us. Even if it looks like everything's falling apart, he's still in control. Um, Patty. Yeah, many times, well, and, and he thinks in some ways that that is what he's doing. He's seeking God's help, right, <laughs> by doing what is not what God told him to do. Uh, so, go ahead, Carl. Yeah, my point was going to be that he says, I have not made supplication to the Lord. So he does this thing, which is against the Lord's will. Mm -hmm. How often is that what religious-minded people do today? They claim to be serving God, but they're doing things that God never expressed of his desire. And they're even quote-unquote, giving glory to God for things that don't glorify the Lord. And they believe they're, they're going to be blessed in that. That's, right. That's, we need to be very careful about this. Right. Yeah, and, and remember some of these things that we're seeing here, because we're, we're going to see that come to play and how Saul handles other situations. And we're going to see that contrasted with how David handles situations. Um, so kind of keep, keep all of this uh, in, in your mind as we continue forward through First Samuel. Go ahead, Patty. Right. <laughs> so, um, so he basically he, he made himself become like I'm going to be like Samuel, and I'm going to do mm -hmm. this. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. He forced himself to do something that was not what God told him to do, though. So. 
Go ahead. It comes down to verse 14 where it says that God's going to find a man that's after his own heart. So it comes down to Sam or Saul was not thinking of God. He's right. Thinking of Saul. Right. And you see, David is a man after his own. So it's, you know, he's after God. Right? He seeks God first. Right. Right. Yeah, and, and one thing that's going to be said of David uh, for, for centuries to come uh, is he did only what was right in my eyes. Um, when, when, he, uh, when later some of the kings of, uh, of Judah or Israel are rebuked, uh, they, they have not been like my servant David who did what was only right in my eyes. Um, now, we'll, we'll see some failures of David as well. Uh, but we'll, we'll start next time in 1 Samuel 14. We're going to see the exact same problem. The same problem that came up in 1 Samuel 13 is going to happen again in a different way in 1 Samuel 14. And it's going to manifest itself in yet another way in 1 Samuel 15. Um, and so hopefully we can learn some lessons from that um, as we uh, make application uh, to, to uh, godly uh, leadership um, for us today. We'll, we'll have more opportunities to talk about application of that next time, um, but uh, Lord willing, we'll pick up there in 1 Samuel 14. Thank you all for your participation. Oh, there, there is a new outline uh, on David.